So, greetings. Hello. This is uh, Tom Staffham again. Um, today's Sunday, the 10th of February, and I'm speaking out again about the ongoing problems to do with the Brexit issue. And today I want to focus on just one main topic. I've given a series of talks in, in uh, Devon and in London, um, where I talked about many different features and recently I gave a talk for St. Bridget's Day here in France. Uh, St. Bridget was the most important patron saint of Ireland, as I explained during that talk. Um, now it's a Sunday on from that, a week later, and I want to address the issue of Ireland. <clears throat> I want to speak about Brexit from the Irish perspective and explain my work to do with peace in Ireland. Uh, not everybody knows all the different peace works I've been up to in the last 30 years. Some of it is confidential, some of it has been done behind closed doors and so on. Um, so I'm going to be revealing and sharing things that <clears throat> probably I've never made public before, except in certain circles. But I feel the time has now come to speak out. Brexit is a serious threat to peace in Ireland. And... I have a duty, therefore, to speak out as a senior uh, peace druid and um, philosopher and intellectual involved in um, <clears throat> global peacemaking. I can't sit quietly and do nothing when the, all the work that we did back in the 90s and 80s to get peace in Ireland <clears throat> may be jeopardised by ignorant politicians who haven't got a clue what they're doing. Um, and I, you know, I lament this fact. Let me just bring you up to speed about, about, I'm going to start with a history of my own work, sort of potted history, and then I'll give an overview of why I think um, peace is endangered in Ireland if we, if we don't do something about it, and, and how important this is. This is like an emergency. We have only less than two months to stop Brexit, and <clears throat> if it's not stopped, conflict and violence, possibly you know, war, is going to break out again. That's my concern and my, my observation as a political scientist and a philosopher, a druid, and a Christian. Um, <clears throat> okay, so my own background, just very briefly, most of you know I was born in Canada, actually, in Montreal. My parents were British, Canadian, landed immigrants, and they lived there for 10 years. My first memories are therefore growing up in Canada. My father was half Irish. Um, his mother was Irish, and the line goes back to a family from County Cork. Uh, I've been to the southwest part of Ireland. Um, <clears throat> Dad was, was a kind and intelligent, uh, self-made intellectual who became a senior figure in management science. And he had very kind Irish eyes. I remember him um, when I was, you know, very small. And he was highly in, in, intelligent. He could... Uh, keep people, you know, entertained and so on. A typical Irish streak, I would say. And he had a great love of history, and he used to take me to ancient country churches around England, Sussex, where we were living after we left Canada. And um, inspired my passion for history. So I studied history at uh, Brighton College, where we did Latin and we did, you know, European history, <clears throat> classical history. It felt like the classical times were just the other day you might walk down the street and meet Cicero. <laughs> um, and I was very, very fortunate to have such a rich European education, if you want. Um, I then went to Brighton Grammar School, did very well in history, but I found the grammar school's teaching disappointing, and I actually dropped out and did my A-levels independently with private tutors, and I studied ancient history as part of that. Uh, which I've always loved. I mean, I love ancient history, Greek and Roman history, the classics and so on. Um, now, in all this, hardly anything was ever said about Ireland. It, one, one, one was just British, but with a sort of English overtone. And so you could say that I experienced a, uh, you know, very, a very... Um, <clears throat> fortunate English education uh, at its kind of classical best. Um, I then went to Bristol University to study philosophy again. Not a word about Ireland or Celtic spirituality, not a word about 
drew a drink. I mean, you know, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> it was the era of logical positivism and, and uh, Wittgenstein and, and uh, all metaphysics is meaningless. I had an instinctive reaction against that and I dropped out of the philosophy course and I walked to Stonehenge. I'd been reading an amazing book about uh, pagan Celtic Britain by Anne Ross, which is a classic of, of paganism. I'd read Robert Graves' The White Goddess and I'd fallen in love with the, the, the Celtic spirituality, the, the idea of the Druid and so on. I was about 19 at the time. And um, <clears throat> I, I had studied yoga, I'd studied meditation, and then discovering the Druid tradition made me realise we had our own in the British Isles. We had them in Ireland and Britain. And we had a continuity. And so <clears throat> one didn't have to go to India and become a Jain monk or a Buddhist monk or a Hindu rishi. We, we had our own equivalents. And by studying languages... I realised that the ancient Indo-European Sanskrit traditions in India were from the same origin as the Celtic. So <clears throat> the word druid means a dharma seer, a truth finder, a truth seer. And that's the function they played in the tribes, exactly like the, um, <clears throat> you know, like the rishis and sages of India. I've just listened to the whole Ramayana story and Valmiki saves the day several times because he testifies to Sita's innocence and so on. Um, he's the sage, he's the druid. Um, <clears throat> whereas, whereas Ram is the warrior, the kshatriya. <clears throat> every tribe has, its, has both. But in every civilised tribe or culture or civilization, the warriors only go and fight when the sages or seers or rishis <clears throat> authorise it. And it was true in, in Christian Europe when the Christian clergy had taken over the functions of the Druids, for instance, here in Gaul, in France. The early Romano-Gallic civilization blended into and became Christian, and the bishops took on the functions of the Druids, um, including blessing, but also cursing, because sometimes the Druid would be called on to curse people of great evil, <clears throat> and uh, it was a kind of magical act they were called to do, and so did some of the bishops of the early church. Um, in fact, I think um, you, you might know that Thomas a Becket actually cursed from Vézelay in the 12th century after he was being persecuted. At, he was Archbishop of Canterbury, and yet the thugs around Henry II, who were later to kill him, were attacking his family, his, his properties in England and so on. So he, he did a very juridical thing. He gave a curse. <laughs> um, it's only done very rarely, I would, I would add. <clears throat> so... Anyway, I got very interested in, in, in it and, and studied uh, freelance in, in Calgary, in the University of Calgary, for four years. I worked in Alberta and put myself through an independent study course that was stronger than any degree I've ever seen. The curriculum I, I set myself was self-directed <clears throat> and I studied world literature, world philosophy and world religious studies um, and including some aspects of Celtic history and so on. <clears throat> um, and then eventually I came back to Britain in 1981 to um, basically make use of the University of London Library and the British Library. And I studied there independently again for two or three years and then finally decided after all this work I ought to get a degree. So I went to the University of London and registered <clears throat> and studied European and world history in enormous detail. Um, <clears throat> I also did courses in, in the history of political philosophy, studied Marx and the, the whole history of political philosophy, liberal, conservative, um, you know, Marxist and so on, Hegelian, uh, going right back to Plato and Aristotle. And when I graduated, I became involved with an institute project to set up an institute of peace studies. And I worked at the edge... Um, Institute of Education at the University of London to help with colleagues create an institute that deal, deals with peace and conflict resolution. And that was brought into being in 1991. <clears throat> and my work is a matter of public record. You can read my autobiographical works and the books I produced. I was registered for a PhD at the university at the same time, and I carried on with you know, some aspects of private research. Some was professional work for the institute. It came into being in 1991. It was based at the Institute of Education. We tried to get funding for a chair or two chairs. Um, 
University College were interested, and um, later those two amalgamated and became one institution. At that point, they weren't, and there was a bit of a tussle as to who would have the chair. Um, and I kind of pulled back a bit and said, well, you know, let's, let's create an institute, as it were, um, as a holding operation until we can get a formal structure, a department going and so on. I still hope that one day the University of London will create, uh, as part of its federal structure, an Institute of Peace Studies um, equivalent to its other institutes. And I would, you know, dearly love to see that come into being. I think it's very necessary for British intellectual life to seriously think about peace. I travelled during that time to many countries, um, and I asked leading intellectuals and professors how they were coping with peace issues. What, what, what did they think peace was? How could you study it? And so on. And that took me to Ireland in 1991. I went to the West Coast to the University of Limerick, where they had an Institute of Peace Education. <clears throat> and it was my first real baptism into higher educational work for peace going on in Ireland. And I sat at the feet and listened to lectures by many learned professors, um, some of whom are dead now, some are still around. Um, and they were from both North and South Ireland. They were, you know, brilliant thinkers. And obviously they were, they were thinking about how we can get peace in Ireland. But they were also thinking about it in a more broad, broad picture. And um, it was a pleasure to be there. And I, I also did some travelling around Ireland. I went to Tara, uh, which was the old Druid centre of the kingship of, of all Ireland. And um, you know, I visited various, various of the towns, Dublin, etc. Um, and <clears throat> I went to Trinity College and fell in love with it. Um, it's got one of the greatest libraries in the British Isles. It's a great academic institution, Trinity College. And, um, you know, I think what I realised from going to Ireland, and I went back several times after that with friends for visits, for peace meetings and talks, I've given lectures in Ireland, and organised meetings and so on. What I realised is that Ireland is a very, very rich uh, culture, historically and intellectually, at least on a par to England. Um, and that there's been tremendous toing and flow, uh, toing and froing between the two cultures. Unfortunately, a lot of it has been violent, and and there's been war and so on. But not always. I mean, I mean, the greatest thinkers I think in in both English and Irish history have recognised and respected each other's achievements. And as I've said before, when the English first got off the boats off the North Sea, pre-Christian, they were they were. Um, unlettered, they were um, inspired by a kind of runic cosmology with Odin and so on, which is recreated quite nicely in the Viking series on television at the moment. But it was pretty warlike and pretty, um, uh, well, it was sort of, it was, it was cosmologically limited. And I think, whereas the Irish had been um, Christianized, they'd, they'd never been conquered by the Roman Empire. Uh, but they were spiritually interested in what was going on. And the early Christian pioneers, uh, most famously Patrick, had taken um, advanced Christian civilization to Ireland. And it had been blended with and adapted to the existing Druid um, you know, intellectual structures of Irish society. Now, this has brought home to me in a brilliant work called The Social History of Ancient Ireland by... Joyce. It's a classic two-volume thing, thousand pages. It was published just before World War I, and, and he had access to all the libraries and documents of ancient Irish history, and he's trying to reconstruct what was ancient Ireland like. And by ancient Ireland, he means basically everything up to the Norman Conquest, up to about 1100. Um, and he produces the king lists, he talks about the role of poetry in society, he talks about law the role that the Druids played in the, um, the you know, the, the judicial procedures. Um, and he talks about everything in, in enormous detail. And he talks about education. And he gives, like, um, parallel charts of how long it took to become a Druid, a, a different class of Druid, and how long it took to become a Christian, you know, uh, to go up the ranks from monk to bishop and archbishop. 
and he correlates them all. Um, if anyone's seriously interested in Irish history, you have to study those two volumes first, as I discovered. Um, <clears throat> I then was um, invited by a colleague who I'd met through the International Peace Research Association, Dr. Sean English, who's an Irish intellectual living outside Dublin, who was then academic dean of the Sar Olskol Meheran, which means the Free University of Ireland. It was bilingual, Gaelic and English, and it was like the Open University of Ireland. It did degrees, still does, um, and it had people doing research in Gaelic, and it was a visionary educational project dreamed up by a, a, a visionary Irish intellectual who's dead, sadly. Um, <clears throat> I just hope the thing, you know, survives and continues, but... Um, I was invited to join the advisory council of that body and went along and met people. We, we had a degree award ceremony in the, um, in the mayor's you know, town council of Dublin. Kevin Burns was, was the gentleman that founded it, who was a visionary thinker and educator. Um, and it was an honour to be you know, in that, on that advisory board. Um, and I met, for instance, people who'd done a degree. One chap did a degree in, um, I think he published it in English, but he'd done a lot of research in Gaelic. In, for about two or three hundred years, it was forbidden to be a Roman Catholic in Ireland. When the English were clamping down with their Protestant ideology after Cromwell's invasions, they desecrated a lot of the abbeys, they destroyed a lot of the libraries. And... Um, I discovered to my horror, you know, that these Cromwellian troops had really destroyed enormous amounts of historical evidence um, for Irish culture and civilization, and, you know, were, were very, very anti-Catholic to a fanatical extent, and um, did war crimes against them and so on. Um, and, yeah, so... And, and forbade the practice of Catholic religion um, under pain of death. And one of the greatest historians of Ireland, who I'd been told about, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey O'Keating, who was happened to be a Catholic priest, he spent many decades, well, many years, going around in the 1630s, the ancient monasteries and abbeys of Ireland, when they still had their libraries intact, and writing down these ancient manuscripts in Gaelic, um, which told the sacred history of Ireland from way, way before. Um, and it, that's really the source of a lot of the juridical knowledge that we have about Irish history and culture. He, he, he um, you know, wrote all this down and produced the, the histories of Ireland, as it's called in English translation, an enormous work in Gaelic, which was then translated into English by um, a man who became the first president of Free Ireland, um, and unfortunately Keating was then mass uh, killed you know, by a Cromwellian type soldier in a church at the altar I mean that's the danger you, you, you underwent if you were a scholar and you happened to be a Catholic now the word Catholic means universal it means someone that subscribes to the universal faith of the universal church whether you're in Armenia or, or Greece or China or wherever um, that's the ideal, the universal, and it's defined metaphysically as someone that subscribes to the universality of truth. Now, I think we would all agree that truth ha has to be universal, it can't be particular, you know, and the same with science, it can't be that oxygen has one formula here in France and another formula in Scotland or another formula in China. Now, oxygen is, is, we know its properties and so on. Well, the same with certain metaphysical truths like do not steal, do not lie, do not commit adultery. The, the fundamental ethics of human nature are universal. Um, and although there are kind of nuances and subtleties and complexities, the, the fundamental universality of those truths, particularly I think non-violence, uh, adhere in all cultures. And, and that's what ca Catholic thinking actually means. Catholic thinking means to search for that universality. Now, that is what the early saints of the church were searching for. That's what Christ was searching for and teaching. And that's what the magisterium of the church has taught ever since. That's called the, you know, the, the, um, the intellectual content of the church's teachings. Church isn't just about going to ceremonies and doing 
sacraments of bread and wine, those are beautiful and ceremonial reenactments of a remembrance and an honouring of that fountain of universal wisdom that came into existence, which Christians call the Incarnation. That beautiful concept that the Logos, the Absolute, took form among us. Um, so I don't think it's a crime to believe that, you know, to search for universality. And, and people like Geoffrey Keating, you know, I lament their death. I mean, this was a true Samoan, amazing guy. There were other scholars working in Ireland at this time, um, producing an amazing book called The Annals of the Four Masters. These were Franciscan and other Christian scholars who, university trained, went around like Keating did, around the abbeys and libraries, and worked out the chronological history of Ireland from documents, you know, doing original historical research. Um, a lot of the source documents were destroyed. Um, but because they did that work, and during the time of Charles I, in fact, who created a... There was a kind of Carolingian Renaissance which made possible um, a, a, a love of scholarship and research. And Charles himself, who was Stuart, obviously, you know, was very interested in these antiquarian studies and, and um, knew what was going on, didn't try and stop it. And um, he also took an interest in Iona, which was founded by Columba, the great Irish saint who um, brought Christianity to the north of Britain and Scotland. And it was Charles I who re-established the abbey there. It was in ruins. There's a plaque in the contemporary abbey that tells that story. Um, you know, so anyway, um, as I grew more interested and knowledgeable about Irish history, I realised what, what an extraordinary thing. On our doorstep, here I am, lived most, a lot of my life in England, and, and it's not on our education system at all. We're not taught these cultural riches. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I tried in my own research to combat that and, and studied and, and became as familiar with Irish history and literature and culture as it's possible. Um, <clears throat> I was also working, obviously, on my thesis and I was... Um, teaching at the University of London and Birkbeck College, and I also taught at the University of Oxford at this time. I was living in the Cotswolds, and um, so I went to Ireland several times, and I also went to visit the Fellowship of Isis. I talked about this with Philip Cargom recently, the, the archdruid of, uh, well, former archdruid of the Order of Ovates, Bards and Druids, a friend of mine. We both went to see um, Clonagall Castle, and, and the Fellowship of Isis, because we're both interested in paganism and Druid stuff. He went there in the 70s. I got there in, in the early 80s. And um, I met um, Durden Robertson, the, the Church of Ireland minister, who got very interested in paganism and, and the classical heritage on which Christianity lay its foundations, the Druid, Celtic, and the Egyptian mysteries particularly. He realised the Hermetic tradition, the Fellowship of Isis grew out of his passion for, for those mysteries. He was the intellectual powerhouse. His sister, Olivia, was, was the mystic, the clairvoyant. I remember her telling me, you know, to adjust my aura in certain ways. I was only about 25. Um, and it was, all, it was all great fun. Okay, so I, I felt like I died and gone to heaven. Here were these people keeping these ancient mysteries alive. And I realised Ireland is a place of enormous esoteric significance and and it really is the mystery keeper for the British Isles as a whole um, you know I'd always been in love with the poetry of Yeats and and, and the incredible world that, that you encounter with Yeats and when I first began writing poetry at the age of 13 and wanted to be a poet you know Yeats was one of the inspirations I had like here was a guy he was telling the truth in his poetry why can't I do it now I was inspired by others, you know, Rilke, Hart, Crane, T.S. Eliot, and so on, um, <clears throat> and some of the French poets, Rambo, and so on. But I realised later, reading Robert Graves, that the poet is just like a step on the way to the Druid. It's, it's, it's using your poetic skills for peacemaking, for healing, for righting wrongs, essentially. You know, the bard is not a thing to tri trivialise. The bard in ancient Celtic history is is the person you turn to for, for the truth, ultimately. You don't go to the king or the chief because they will say the political truth. They will, they will say whatever gets them more power. The bard is the one who's sanctioned by the community to tell the truth. 
And so, <clears throat> you know, during the course of my life, I've, I've sharpened and deepened my own bardic witness through poetry mainly, but also through music and, and through teaching and, and scholarship. And that's why I'm speaking out. You know, I have a duty as, as the peace bard of Britain and Ireland um, through circumstances too strange to relate, I became involved with the Druid Council of Britain, and it has membership in Ireland. And <clears throat> in '97, I went representing the Council of British Druid Orders to Tara. We had a peace ceremony, and we did invocations for peace in the four quarters, and bards and poets and druids were there from all over Ireland, north and south. I was one of a contingent that went from, from Britain. Some Welsh and, and other people came. And it was a marvellous ceremony. You know, it's, it was a very moving experience to invoke peace between our islands, right? And within a few weeks of that ceremony, um, the Irish IRA laid down their weapons. They, made, they declared a peace, a peace treaty. They declared a ceasefire. And eventually that took form as the Good Friday Agreement in 98. Um, and I think it was in 98 that I was there, or it might have been 97. But anyway, it was a few weeks later that literally the Good Friday Agreement came into place. And I feel that in our, in our intellectual work, in our bardic and, and peace druid role, we helped facilitate that. You know, People work at different levels. Mo Molan was working at the political level to get that peace treaty agreed. I was working at the metaphysical level as a philosopher. And, um, you know, my institute had been set up, as I said, in 91, following tours around the States. I spoke twice at the UN headquarters, and I had a pretty good sense of which academics were doing what for peace around the world. And I was delighted. I was, I was moved when finally we got peace in Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and that's why I'm so, you know, gobsmacked that this bunch of politicians either have no memory, they were not involved, they're too young, or they just have a very, very cynical, um, <clears throat> manipulative kind of approach to reality. I have no time for people that cannot tell the truth and steer for the truth. You know, I'm a Dharma seer. I will not deviate from Dharma. And what's happening with Brexit is not Dharmic. It is anti-Dharma. So back to Ireland. Um, <clears throat> I came to the view in um, uh, sort of after, after 2001, after the tragedy of 9-11, which, which I think struck us in the world as a huge blow. Um, I was then training as a religious studies teacher. I'd, I'd um, you know, carried on with my PhD, but it wasn't complete. PhDs are notoriously difficult to finish, especially if you take on a huge project like I did, which was to tell the story of the search for peace from 1945 onwards among all different intellectuals everywhere. You know, it's a vast topic. Eventually, I had to narrow it down, and I did finish it, <clears throat> and and you know, it was, I got my PhD finally, but it just took so long. Meanwhile, <clears throat> I am. Um, I was shocked by the events of 9-11 and, and went back to work, effectively, you know, <clears throat> and, and continued with the Institute. It was no longer part of the University of London, but it was independent. And it ended up in Wales, um, in a fantastic ashram um, run by a Hindu guru, and then its own little base in Llanerville. And for seven years, I taught from Wales. I trained as a religious studies teacher. And then... <clears throat> I discovered to my horror how limited the curriculum is in UK schools. I had probably the best job in, in UK educational curriculum in that as head of religious studies and philosophy, you are pretty free to develop the curriculum how you want. The trouble is the kids that come are so narrowly taught in the other subjects that they only esteem nowadays mainly the sciences and maths because they're taught those things matter. Um, at A level, they're doing business studies and, and maths and economics and so on. <clears throat> and they think ethics and spirituality and philosophy and religion are just, they don't, they're not even on their radar. From, I'd say nine times out of ten children these days in British schools, it's become an almost totally secularized culture. What's replaced spirituality and religion is a kind of me first thinking. 
<clears throat> um, and a selfishness and an arrogance and a cruelty, which I saw among the behavior patterns of children I was teaching, which I found shocking to the core. I, I'd never met. I, I, I didn't know what it looked like to exist in a post-philosophical society, but that's what I encountered. And, um, you know, there are no rules, there's no ethics, there's no higher power, there's no God, there's, no, there's nothing. There's simply me and what I can acquire. And I would say it's, it's to use my mother's Marxist language, it's the, it's the after effect of cynical capitalism at its brutal worst, which individualizes everybody and makes everybody compete against each other. Um, and, and everybody in, in fear of poverty and, and falling off you know, the, the, the edge. And so therefore there's this ruthless competitiveness comes in. And it starts at the school level because the kids are taught you have to be better than him or her or you won't get to university and you won't get a good job and you won't get to the top of the pile. And of course if you're a bit slow in learning or you're, you, know, you prefer art or you prefer music or something, well then you, you, there's no place for you in the contemporary English education system. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, did, I did what I could and I, I made my lessons, I think, showcases of what an authentic educational experience should be about. And kids often resonated at a deep spiritual level. I had some great friendships that still continue um, with, with some of the children I taught. And I set up philosophy clubs and I had great discussions with kids about you know, the aura and life after death and reincarnation and so on. And I, I, have a, I have a great deep faith and confidence in, in children naturally we all have this innate intelligence within us, and I wanted. I mean, I, I, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I believe in the uh, the gifted and talented scheme that runs in schools, which Tony Blair set up. One of the good things he did, and I think that everybody has some kind of unique talent, which can be brought out. But we're up against the system that sets the exams and sets the curricula, and. I was shocked. You cannot do Irish studies. You cannot study Irish language. You can't do Irish literature and culture and philosophy and so on in, in British schools. I think since then there's been a GCSE set up um, at A-level. Very few people, you know, it's, it's thought, what, what? Irish studies? What's that? You know, where's Ireland? I often had kids in my class, if I was trying to teach, say, a lesson on Celtic spirituality, and I'd try and, you know, say, well, what country do we live in? Well, England, isn't it? Well, what's England? Well, it's the centre of the universe. <laughs> you know, and it was very hard to get from them any kind of acknowledgement that England is actually part of a thing called the UK, and that includes Northern Ireland and Wales Island. Yeah, well, it's... You know, they didn't have the geographical knowledge that there was anything outside England. And then I think that shortage of educational experiences is what's shown up in the Brexit vote. It's, I mean, I've had people come to visit me here in the Peace Museum who've said, yeah, I voted for Brexit. And then I asked them to draw a map of the United Kingdom, and they literally, you know, can't do it. <clears throat> I mean, they have no consciousness of, of, like, there's a thing called Scotland, and they might know Wales because they've been there on a couple of holidays, but the, the geographical educational awareness of, of the English people is very, very woeful and lacking. I'm not talking about elite levels. I'm not talking about, you know, eat and educated people. I'm talking about the, the, the normal mass of, of English educated people. Um, and I think that's a, that is a lacuna that needs looking into. I think it's scandalous. And it reflects in this, this Brexit um, kind of nationalism that England, you know, is, is the centre of the universe kind of thing. This brings me back to the thing about Ireland, because um, during my time in, in the 2000s, I had got very interested in um, <clears throat> the Druid work around Stonehenge, and I set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for uh, Stonehenge, working with a pagan priest called George Fursoff, who's dead now. And we mediated between the police, English Heritage, the Druids,